Okay, Power Up Hawaii, we're back. Two o'clock rock. We have uh, Raya Salter. She's an energy and environmental attorney and consultant. She's the principal of Imagine Power LLC, and she's here with us today doing Power Up Hawaii. Let's meet Raya. Hi, Raya. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Raya, tell us about yourself. Well, thank you very much. First, I am so happy to be here. I want to thank you and thank everybody here in the studio for being so welcoming and warm and showing me so much aloha on my first show. So yes, my name is Raya Salter. I am an energy attorney, um, clean energy advocate, and community outreach specialist. I moved here from New York City in January, where I was an attorney for the Natural Resources Defense Council. What is that? That is an organization that does uh, clean energy advocacy, also food, water, land, wildlife, um, in the United States um, and also globally. Mm. Wow, exciting. Wow. But you, did you go litigation for them or advocacy in some other no, way? No, I am. Energy advocacy is interesting. It's, um, it's sort of a mix of corporate and litigation. Um, I have an undergraduate degree in economics from Wesleyan University um, and a um, JD from Fordham Law School. You were teaching there also? Yeah? Yes, I'm also an adjunct professor at Fordham Law School. Mm -hmm. And after law school, I went into corporate practice, corporate energy practice, focusing on um, energy mergers and acquisition and the regulation of energy assets. So when we talk about um, sort of practicing in the energy area, um, there's this corporate nature in terms of very big deals, multi-billion dollar deals as we look at huge infrastructure uh, passing hands. Um, and then you move into the regulatory space where um, the corporations meet the other stakeholders, the public, the consumer advocates, the clean energy advocates, um, and a public process moves forth to sort of figure out how our energy system is going to transform, hopefully to the benefit for all. Mm -hmm. So at NRDC, and uh, before that at the Environmental Defense Fund, I did advocacy to promote the integration of clean and renewable energy onto the electric grid. Mm. Just a question comes to mind is that uh, what I hear in between the words is that your advocacy is not necessarily the kind of activism that seeks to stop things. You rather prefer to negotiate things and establish a middle ground where the energy, you know, energy efforts can proceed in a way that satisfies your clients without, you know, breaking the bank on the, um, on the capital side. Am I right? Um, I would say yes and no. I think we need all of the tools in the box to move forward on a clean energy transition away from fossil fuel. We need activists. We need teachers. We need community leaders. We need artists and musicians, people who tell stories. Um, we need policy folks. We need engineers. We need government leaders. We political need champions. Political champions. Yeah. We need all of these actors to work together. And yes, there is a political push-pull uh, between actors. Some folks are more extreme. So everyone has their way of being an advocate. And I think that's what I'm so excited about this show um, and Think Tech Hawaii is that it's about you know, how can this mix of people come together on this really complex topic? Yet it's complex, but everyone understands yeah. that we need to work to create a cleaner environment and have clean and renewable energy. Well, okay, let's talk about the show. If you didn't pick it up by now, actually, Raya Salter is going to be host. This is the first show under the, under the rubric Power Up Hawaii. It's a wonderful name for a show. And we love energy, so we want to do as much energy as we possibly can when we see you as a, a valuable player in that conversation. Thank you. Um, but how do you see it? How do you see that show unfolding? What kind of subjects do you want to cover? What kind of people do you want to bring in? What, what, kind, of, um, you know, what kind of messages do you want to send? I think that one of the problems, um, sp particularly in energy, because it is, it can be complicated and it can be so focused on technology, and that is, that is wonderful, it's interesting, it's why um, people like me are energy nerds, um, but um, engineers and accountants can't 
we can't move to a clean and energy future with just the engineers and accountants. Um, there is a role for all folks in the community to play. And what I'd really like to do is tap into those who are um, do, who are interested in clean energy advocacy, who are important stakeholders in the conversation, um, or who are messaging uh, renewable energy and have a vision for it. And can we talk to those folks about what is it that you're doing? How can you reach out to others to sort of increase your movement? But also, what kind of bridges can you build between you and other communities because a more inclusive process, I think, will result in a better outcome for uh, clean and renewable, clean, renewable energy. Okay, let me ask you a question that comes to mind. In a perfect world, why can't I just do it? Uh, you know, we have to get transformed. Not easy. It's, it costs a lot of money. Uh, it, it draws down capital from multiple sources. Um, there's a lot of engineering involved and it's a moving target, it's changing all the time. The technology is complex. Uh, wouldn't it be more efficient? <laughs> I know how you're gonna answer this. Wouldn't it be more efficient to just do it? Get out of my way, I'm gonna do it. Anne yeah. Rand and Atlas shrugged, I'm gonna do it. You know, this is an excellent question. Um, we are moving from a time when I think most people who are interested in, you know, we've had this anxiety, we've known about the reality of, um, of climate change and how catastrophic um, it will be for us, our children and their children. But in many ways, one feels powerless. One feels like, does it really matter that I'm recycling this bottle? Does it, you know, really matter that I'm, you know, taking out my trash in a certain way? It was difficult to feel, or even if just me riding my bicycle, it was difficult to feel empowered. Now, we're at such a critical point with energy infrastructure. Not only do we need to make this change, but our system is now over 100 years old. It's aging, it's dirty and polluting. There's literally trillions of dollars that needs to be reinvested just in our current crumbling energy infrastructure. We can't double down on the old system. Happily, the cost of a lot of these technologies has begun to come down. In fact, in many instances, solar power in some jurisdictions including uh, Hawaii, is cheaper than conventional generation. Mm -hmm. So we are in a place where individuals can step up and say, I am going to do it. I am going to do this on my own. I want to have my own isolated system that does not work with the utility. Or I want to own my own gener uh, solar generation and sell it back to the utility. So that is exactly where we are, be you an individual, be you a business, um, be it the utility. We need to make these investments. They need to be clean. And there is a way for us, for folks to participate in, 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 and, and feel, feel the power. Well, I think you're giving us a window on, on what you're going to be discussing, who you're going to be talking to. And the magic word is participation. Because um, th to take your point, you can't have a transformation of your society. And, and going to clean energy is a transformation of your society. It's where we, where we live. It's everything around us. It's all the machines, you know, and the things that help us do the things we want to do. We, we can't do them without energy. That's the reality of it. And, and to transform that critical mission, critical system is expensive, difficult, and it, it's iconoclastic in the sense that it breaks all the old rules so, okay, we have to participate. Everybody has to be involved. How are you going to cover that on your show? I think just even at the outset, we can begin to reach out to some diverse actors. Um, people at, at, very, at the beginning need to be identified. People um, can see what other folks are doing. So, say, one uh, energy stakeholder that is really looking to get the word out about their programming, say it's energy efficiency, it's something that could provide so much benefit to so many people. Well, wouldn't it be cool to, for them potentially to know that there is a community group that does, um, that goes to 
you know, that goes to uh, community meetings and engages people on energy education. You know, this, you know, and many times these silos that you referred to, um, they really are real. So, especially in New York, I've been in, in situations where, say, the, the governmental entity looking to administer programs wants to interact more with community-based organizations, but really have not even identified who those people are. So if we can begin to reach out to uh, talk to diverse stakeholders, I think that's one way to, um, to, um, to start the process moving. Well, it sounds like you can not only talk to them about what their concerns are, but you can also try to bring them into the thought process. I mean, for example, I don't think people, I don't think people understand about transformations that they cost money, even if renewable energy is cheaper in the final analysis, you know, when everything is in place, you have to put it in place and you have to buy all that technology, all kinds of new systems, you have to take out the old systems and um, gee whiz, things are much more expensive now than they were in 1910. Trust me on this, I have good authority on this. This, and, is, <laughs> an inc this is an incredibly important point and it goes again to why it's so important for stakeholders to be involved and to people to, for people to understand more about each other. The issues that you raise in terms of um, making an investment in the system, what does it mean to an asset when it, is, um, when it needs to be removed or is a stranded cost? Who pays that cost? Um, all of these are really important questions. It is the people, the millennials, and the children now who are going to pay in their lifetime, in their peak earn earnings income time, they are going to pay the costs of these investments. Um, as will different um, community stakeholders. At the same time, the nature of the new technology is much more interactive with consumers. Knock wood. So, I had a chair over here. I knock wood. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> it involves things like demand response, um, different levels for folks to react to prices at different times of day. Now, these things cannot be successfully implemented without some further uh, level of engagement with customers, um, with the people who use the energy system. So there needs to be, um, the wheels need to be greased at that nexus, and folks need to understand what's at stake. Yeah, you know, you're giving me thoughts about this. And so we, we have been um, trying to make money, you know, frankly, uh, and, and the <laughs> government has been trying to avoid criticism. That's what governments do, they try mm. to avoid criticism. Um, and, um, and, and a lot of players in the, in the field, they try to avoid change. That's what they do. Yeah. So you, you get a really uh, uh, ambitious program here, actually, right? <laughs> to try to get them to the table and have them change their spots, so to speak. Um, so, you know, what, what do you see in terms of changing the spots, changing the way those millennials think? Uh, having them understand they're going to have to pay for this more than me they're going to have to pay for this and their lives are going to be affected adversely because they have to dig deep in their pocket. Um, what do you say to them? How do you bring them into this table and make them, you know, understand the fundamental process here, but also that it's going to affect them? Um, I, I think that that's it. Really, it's by trying to get the message out exactly what what you are saying. Um, it's incredibly important that the young people, younger people, engage in the conversation. Not only are they going to have to pay for the system, but it is they and their children that will face um, the negative impacts of climate change. Um, and of course, islands um, are on the front lines of this climate change. You know, I, <clears throat> we only have a minute before the break, but let me, let me offer this. Uh, you know, the, the show just last hour was with uh, Avi Seufer, the dean of the uh, William S. Richardson School of Law. And one of the things we talked about in the context of uh, what, what we call it, uh, reconstituting the republic, that is, you know, <clears throat> dealing with the, ch having the constitution flexible enough to deal with the changes that have been revealed by this election. It's the same thing, isn't it? Because those millennials that you're talking about and the ex-gen people coming soon, um, they don't trust the government. And one of the constituent pl stakeholders in all of this energy transformation is the government and utilities. They're kind of like quasi-government. And so th these kids have to learn to trust 
the organizations, not just to throw them out for whatever they say, but to trust them and work with them and be part of a collaborative effort. This isn't easy. Yeah, well, you know, though, what I, what I say to that is that our 120-plus year energy system is not the only sort of major global shift that, you know, neither is climate change that is affecting these young people. Also, what's happening is the baby boomers are passing the torch to them. Um, the time is, be is, is, is approaching where um, the younger people will literally need to step into the roles um, at the utility. There's this generational shift. You've got um, retirements nationwide of, um, of utility workers. They're going to need to step into these, these new economies, these new shoes, and make it reflect their, um, their values and their conscience. Yeah, now, now I'm beginning to understand where you're going on this. Um, <clears throat> okay, we're going to get into a discussion of exactly what's happening status-wise on the mainland and, for that matter, w the world. Uh, and we're going to discuss also what's happening in Hawaii and how it all connects up. Uh, very exciting. Uh, with Raya Salter, uh, a, an attorney and uh, environmental uh, energy person and consultant with principal. Uh, she's a principal attorney of Imagine Power LLC and um, in Power Up Hawaii. We'll be right back. I pity the fool who ain't watching this show at 12 o'clock on Friday afternoon. Stan, the energy man, watch it. Hi, I'm Ray Starling and I am co-host for Hawaii's Wednesday afternoon State of Clean Energy. And with me today is Leslie Cole Brooks and she's going to tell you what's happening this month with our shows. Hi everybody, I'm Leslie Cole Brooks, the Executive Director of the Distributed Energy Resources Council and this month is the focus is on distributed energy resources. We just had a great show on smart grid technologies and the rest of the month we're going to discuss storage, different strategies, microgrids, and then we're going to have live man and woman on the street from Verge. So it's really exciting, very informative, um, lively, and just worth doing. So see you next Wednesday. Thank you. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're drinking water on the set. We're going to stop doing that now. <laughs> okay, that's Raya Salter. We're powering up Hawaii right here in her show. And we have these... Uh, these um, you know promotional footage during the break and all these people they're all your guests you're going to be you're going to be dealing with uh, you know uh, Ray Starling and <laughs> Leslie Cole Brooks and you know this is your universe wonderful, wonderful people <laughs> yeah really. wonderful people I'm yeah. privileged to know yeah so Ryan knows these people anyway so um, okay I want to I want to get to the national global kind yeah. of lay of the land mm -hmm. you know in Hawaii. This all became part of the public consciousness uh, in November of um, uh, 2020, 2008. Mm. And, um, and that's because we had this clean energy agreement. And although there had been discussion in you know, decades past, this was sort of a crystallization mm. of the issue. It was, it was the government nod, the government mm, compact that we wanted to go ahead with. Mm. And since that time, it's, you know, it's been off to the races. Mm. Um, now, the mainland has moved at a different speed. Uh, in some ways, the mainland is behind us. In some ways, the mainland is now catching up or maybe exceeding us. Uh, what is going on nationally? Um, and I suppose I could ask you, how do you think that might be affected by the election today on Election Day? <laughs> That's an extremely important question. While I think we should mention the election, while it is not my intention to be political, um, for the most part, here we have a clear choice when it comes to climate and the environment. We have a candidate that is a climate denier who has said that he wants to tear up the Paris Agreement on uh, um, reducing global greenhouse gas That's emissions helpful. and um, wants to stop clean and energy renewable development. And Incredible. We ha Incredible. It's hard to believe. And we have a candidate who is progressive on climate and uh, wants to continue to walk forward with um, international partners and continue, importantly, to implement um, and enforce the reductions that we agreed to in Paris here in the United States. So that's a clear choice on climate. I encourage folks to go out and vote. Vote your conscience. Vote your values. Um, uh, and given that we're literally at this explosive moment of that decision and choice where in mere hours we'll know 
maybe I'll, <laughs> I'll leave that piece. <laughs> I'll leave that piece there in terms of what is going to happen going forward politically. Um, although there are some extremely important um, trends that include political trends um, nationally, internationally, with regard to uh, clean and renewable energy. Um, we know we have the historic Paris Agreement, and that that means we have shifted from, it's still important to make agreements, but how are we going to implement and enforce them? Um, uh, in the United Big question. S huge question. In the United States, we have the Clean Power Plan, which Can is... Can we sign off on that agreement yet? <laughs> Just a thought. A hundred, a hundred, I believe a hundred, over a hundred countries have ratified the Paris Agreement. Um, and, but whether or not the Clean Power Plan will be able to roll forward in the United States um, is an important question that's actually tied up in the courts right now. Uh. Um, in terms of... And who says the government is uh, dysfunctional? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's right. Hawaii is at the tip of the spear. Um, when it comes to clean and renewable energy development. I believe it's the most important state in the country um, in terms of where are we going to go next. And that is why I have chosen to come here. Uh, there, it is important for... So it's a laboratory for you? Well, no. no. It's advanced. Well, it offers the possibility of, of being further, further out than anyone else. It, and it is. So there, there are two, two points I'd like to address on that. Once, one, there is a moral imperative to um, further clean and renewable energy for Hawaii and other islands in the Pacific. Why? Uh, Hawaii and other islands in the Pacific are at the f on the front lines of climate change, having contributed the least greenhouse gas reductions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions to the global picture. They will suffer the impacts first. And this is the part that's a bit of a downer and depressing. Hawaii, Samoa, Tonga, FSM, Guam, Palau, the Marshall Islands, are facing um, the specter of loss of life, land, culture, and place. So there is a moral imperative for the international community to make sure that clean and renewable energy development um, can improve people's lives while um, making islands withstand ex uh, rising seas and extreme weather events. Now there is also, beyond the moral imperative, there's an economic imperative because of the fuel imports, Hawaii pays the highest energy prices in the country, yes. um, which is a, a tremendous burden on business, individuals, and in particularly the poor. Uh, the same is true of other Pacific islands. So furthering um, clean and renewable energy can improve energy security, it can free up economies, and allow for the economic development um, that is needed for Hawaii and other, other islands to thrive. And this is something we should be looking at doing together. In addition, the, beyond the sort of relevance, Hawaii has the highest levels of solar penetration in the country. One estimate is 17%. So we are in the thick of being ahead of everyone but else. But we slowed down. We have slowed down. We have slowed down. And uh, yes, and that leads us to where we are on the policy front. Um, and in that, in that instance, Hawaii is also um, at the forefront, but also with some national trends. In New York, yeah, right. A lot of these companies are slowing down on the mainland too. Yeah. In 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 so the so I think everyone understands that a lot of folks want to participate in clean energy, and that that has created some challenges with the utility here. I think everybody understands that. Um, and where folks are here and throughout the country is how do we strike that balance, and how do we provide a fair um, value and price for renewable energy. Um, be it owned by a private individual, be it owned by a um, solar company, be it owned by the utility. So with um, NRDC, uh, I represented NRDC in the proceedings in New York where they're trying to figure this out. The same conversation is happening here. Um, it's, it's important from a, from a policy perspective um, and it's moving forward. Well, you know, it, it, just, it just sort of con connected for me while you were speaking. You were into uh, mergers and acquisitions. Now I know you were doing mergers and acquisitions for advo advocating ad advocacy groups rather than the capital no, no, concentration. No, it was the capital concentration in private practice. Oh, yes. you were? Yes, oh, okay, yes. well that's, that's even more totally relevant. So we had this experience, and I'm sure you saw it with NextEra. Mm -hmm. um, NextEra, unfortunately, you know, did not get approval. Um, but it, but it is, the question is still open. 
Um, and a lot of people felt it should have gotten approval because mm -hmm. it had a deep pocket, mm -hmm. it had engineering, it had a track record of being able to put complex deals together, mm -hmm. and it had a great future in terms of affecting national energy policy. So, you know, there were benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but Hawaii didn't see it that way in general, and the PUC didn't see it that way. So query, <clears throat> where does that fit for you, for your inquiry, if you will, um, are we are we in positioned in a place where we need to have that kind of capital come in? Uh, is the utility better off, do you think, going forward to join the national consolidation momentum mm. in energy? I think I think you've put your finger on something that's extremely important. There is a national trend on consolidation amongst um, utilities nationwide. Um, I won't, uh, I won't tr ap try and look into a crystal ball in terms of whether or not it would be better. Um, will there need to be a lot of capital investment to make this transition happen? Yes. May the, Hawaiian, uh, the, the, uh, the energy companies in Hawaii seem attractive targets for potential suitors? Yes, that's also possible. That's coming from an, an M&A attorney now. That's a serious statement. We're an attractive <laughs> target for, for acquisition. I, 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 you know, I think that, um, you know, yeah, yeah, you may very well see, um, see more suitors. Mm. At the same time, the state is trying to move forward on a conversation of what is the best model for the utility? We've got a co-op in Kauai. Um, what, is the, what is the best model? Um, and so this conversation is happening in terms of you know, what is the utility's role, what is the private actor's role, and what should their role be as we try and uh, achieve more clean energy. Wow, I feel like I'm talking to somebody who is going to have a huge effect on this, aside from the show. <laughs> You're positioned in the perfect place to, to see all these disparate elements in our, in our transformation uh, and, maybe, uh, and maybe help them. I mean, I, and, and let me add, let me add um, you know, uh, the nicest way, at least in Hawaii, for this to work is, is with love and affection. Um, you know, uh, you know uh, we, we should work together, but we should also really enjoy it, and we should not compete for the sake of it, and we should talk to each other and exchange information and work, work together. I think you've, you've exactly put your finger on it. The only way that I hope to insert myself in these conversations here is from a position of wanting to be, wanting to be a help, um, of seeing how, um, how I can help the um, process move forward and what kind of conversations can I join. And can we make this something that is fun, interesting, fun, and enjoyable? Fun, interesting, why not? It's technology, <laughs> it's looking into the future. We only have a minute left, uh, Raya, but I'd like to offer you the opportunity to talk to our viewers ah. and, you know, take a moment with them, engage with them and tell them what you're going to do and why they should follow you and listen to you and <laughs> check you out every week. All right. Well, hello, everyone out there. Be you in Hawaii, Samoa, or New York City. I um, am so glad to be here, and I'm looking forward to starting what I hope will be a fun, enjoyable, and important conversation. I think uh, we're going to have interesting guests. We're going to have things for policy wonks and nerds. We're going to have musicians and artists who <laughs> help <right>. <laughs> tell these, um, who help tell these stories. I think that's actually a crucial part: is having um, having our um, our storytellers understand. Um, uh, and and, and um, be the Pied Pipers to help other people um, understand the important energy messages. In fact, I think that's really what it's about, is how can we break down these complex topics um, in ways that are fun and accessible. I was told that talking about energy, it's like really talking to your like really smart uncle who like works in the hardware of his business on Thanksgiving. <laughs> you know, he's a really smart man. He doesn't want to be talked down to, um, but he wants. He already understands the basic undercurrents, and he really wants to. Um, he wants to engage and understand more. So I think we're going to talk with great stakeholders here in Hawaii. We're going to get people on Skype from islands in the Pacific, from New York, from California. Um, and let's see what lessons we can learn and what lessons we can all share. I'm excited. <laughs> I think it's great. So look forward to, uh, to see uh, Ray Assalter um, uh, on Tuesdays. 
And uh, you'll find out more about energy and you'll find it out from a special vantage point, a, a special way of looking at it. <laughs> uh, she's a principal attorney of Imagine Power LLC. The name of this show going forward is Power Up um, uh, Hawaii. And uh, now we have met Raya. Thank you so much, Raya. Thank you so much, Jay.